Hi, everybody. I'm Howard Hu. I'm the dean of the Dalawana School of Public Health, at least for the next four weeks. <laughs> um, first, let me acknowledge the land on which we sit and stand. This is located in the traditional indigenous lands of the Anishinaabe, Mississauga, Haudenosaunee, Ojibwe Chippewa, and the Huron Wendat Nations. This is an acknowledgement you'll hear regularly in presentations and events here at the School of Public Health, not only because we owe it to ourselves and our indigenous partners and friends, but this school in particular, as the home of the new Wakabin S. Bryce Institute for Indigenous Health, has a leadership role to play in advancing indigenous health in the university, in Toronto, Ontario, and the world. Welcome. This is the third in our Dean's Leadership Series. This is an event that is intended to provide a platform for discussing the biggest issues that affect population health worldwide. But it's also a venue with a bit of a twist. We, as the leading school of public health in Canada, in the financial and cultural capital of the country, have the opportunity to bring this discussion on what is the evidence that is needed to advance population health. What is the training of the young people, the skills that they will need to advance these topics uh, and our progress on these types of issues. And that's the whole point of these Dean's Leadership Series. We're here today to discuss the issue of climate change and cities. It's an enormous issue, one that touches everyone directly or indirectly, and one that also poses a challenge to our school's other initiatives related to global health, big data for population health, indigenous health, healthy cities. But we have an opportunity to integrate those initiatives and the thinking and to get the input from folks like you, our stakeholders, our associated scholars and our community to make this an elevated discussion. Uh, let me thank uh, Erica DiRiguero, Laura Rosella, Ross Baker, uh, Anita Benoit, uh, some of the faculty members on the committee that put together this event. And now let me just give you an introduction to the issue from our point of view. The World Health Organization describes climate change as the biggest single challenge facing humanity today. It's a particularly acute issue for cities, which are arguably the source of much of the energy consumption that has driven the greenhouse gases and some of the climate change, but that also will suffer some of the harshest effects of climate change because of the density of the populations, the urban heat island effect where temperatures in cities can be expected to be 5, 10, sometimes 15 degrees higher uh, than in the countryside. Cities, of course, are a population health issue of themselves. With an acceleration in urbanization over the last 30 years, now, as of two years ago, over half of the world's population lives in cities. On top of the challenges posed by climate change, cities have their own peculiar set of issues, such as how the impact of urban sprawl in metropolitan areas uh, has led to, with the lack of physical activity, exacerbation of the obesity epidemic that has spread relentlessly around the world. Researchers, in fact, have estimated that the, just this increase in weight of the general population has increased significantly the fuel consumption, which then leads to this other vicious circle where we're increasing greenhouse gases and our accelerated uh, pathway to climate change. Mega cities, defined as those cities greater than 10 million in population, have tripled over the last two decades, pushing the boundaries of sanitation and the sustainability of safe food and water supplies to its very limits. And those are 
two of the most vulnerable aspects of population health when it comes to climate change. And we think of the shifts in rainfall, deforestation, and all the other desertification, salination issues that accompany climate change. There has been a perception that there's a kind of urban advantage. We actually have come to embrace urbanization as by itself having some advantages for population health. In general, urban populations are generally healthier than rural populations because of access to employment, health care. There are certain efficiencies when it comes to energy use, transportation. On the other hand, it's been overshadowed by the recognition that urban growth has created enormous health disparities within cities. And you see that every day in North American cities and even here in Canada, which is so much a, a country that's striving towards and pushing towards equity. New vulnerabilities have been identified. It's not just the urban heat effect. It's how we deal with the transport of food, the distribution of food, uh, the enormous new demands that are coming for food and water in the newest megacities, which are all occurring in low and middle income countries that have the least capacity to adapt. That is not to say that the countryside and the rural areas will not be affected by climate change. And in fact, even here, there's been a Canadian example where in the Slims River in the Yukon Territory, uh, there's actually been a complete turnoff of the water. It vanished. A result of river piracy where one river system steals from the other, a process that typically takes centuries, but in this case was documented over the course of one spring with researchers studying this and concluding that in fact global warming was impacting the retreat of the glaciers that fed those rivers and altered the river drainage pattern at a very rapid pace. Serves as a reminder that climate change may bring surprises that we do not fully appreciate and we're not prepared for. Worldwide, climate change is also accompanied by huge anxiety over shifting patterns of infectious disease. In India, where I had the privilege of organizing a climate change symposium in 2009 with our colleagues at the Public Health Foundation of India and the India Council for Medical Research and the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, we could see and already project what the changing patterns of climate will mean in terms of increases in malaria in states in India where malaria has been not present for centuries. Dengue, yellow fever, cholera, all exacerbated by climate change. Even the non-communicable chronic diseases that we worry about will experience changes and increases related to the shifting patterns of air pollution and how air pollution is modified uh, by climate change. All of this is in the backdrop of understanding global health disparities. And arguably, climate change is the biggest example of global health inequities, with the countries that are producing most of the greenhouse gases suffering the least in terms of what the impacts will be on death, displacement, malnutrition, et cetera. But on the other hand, in a globalized world, we have to work together in order to do the research, do the adaptation uh, that will mitigate these changes, particularly in low and middle income countries where, of course, the effects will be the worst. This is a particularly auspicious time since we are also living in a political climate where the climate deniers now own, occupy the White House. And we have a particularly important role as scientists, policymakers in the neighbor to the north in advancing the logic 
the inescapable rationale for dealing with climate change. We need to think beyond the four-year political cycles, no matter what they bring us, and focus on the long-term health of our communities. Now, public health schools are right at this wonderful place where we can be a forum venue where we can create intersectoral solutions because these are the kinds of approaches that are needed for an issue as big as climate change. But we don't have control over the policy levers that can bring change. That will happen because of our alumni, our friends, our stakeholders who learn about these issues and partner with us in visualizing the changes that are necessary uh, to deal with this massive problem. Now we have today four speakers who are just going to spend a few minutes at the very beginning telling, sharing with you some thoughts from their very specific and unique vantage points. Um, and we have with us Peter Donnelly, the President and CEO of Public Health Ontario, a crown agency that is not only mandated to address the health needs and population health needs of Ontarians, but it's also a crown agency with some insulation from the politics of the day and the ability to see farther. Paula Breitstein, associate professor at the, here at the Dalana School of Public Health, actually spends 80% of her time away from the Dalana School of Public Health. Uh, she's the occupant of uh, the Canadian Institutes for Health Research Applied Public Health Chair um, and located in Moy, Kenya, where she leads a research effort and global health platform building effort with our colleagues at the University of Moy in dealing with HIV, AIDS, but also non-communicable chronic diseases in Moy, Kenya. An epidemiologist uh, who's been working in Kenya since 2007. She also is leading co-leading our new Planetary Health Initiative. Fiona Miller, Associate Professor in our Institute for Health Policy Management and Evaluation, founder of IHPME's Climate Change Committee. This is the institute where our policy leaders, our health economists who can measure with yardsticks that the policymakers know uh, and uh, help us really understand impacts and the kinds of initiatives and what their impacts may be as well. Her research examines how innovative health technologies are adopted in hospitals and how improved patient outcomes within sustainable and fair healthcare systems can be achieved. And finally, Ifra Abdullahi, a PhD student here at the Dalana School of Public Health who's also in our collaborative specialization uh, in global health. She's had a fantastic work experience uh, resume working all over the world and for NGOs. But here, her doctoral project will examine urbanization and climate change adaptation through an analysis of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 6. That is, ensuring availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. Her research will explore the impact of an increasingly unstable climate on people living in urban areas of Western Africa and their access to safe water. Now in the backdrop slide, and sort of the subcontext for this entire conversation, I bring you back to this whole concept of what are these big, big issues that affect the entire world. These are the Sustainable Development Goals, formulated and launched a couple of years ago by the United Nations, and they represent the aspirations worldwide of all countries, and especially how we pursue development in low and middle income countries. And you'll notice as we carry on these kinds of conversations that every single one of these goals has a touch point with population and public health. Every single one of them relate to a risk factor or something that will advance population health in ways that we are still trying to understand so that we can give that information to our policymakers. We call it the health and all policies sensibility. 
how in fact, when we think about the health of women, particularly as it relates to maternal and child health, what is clear now is that all of the investments made, for as an example, by societies in providing contraception and contraception availability in low and middle income countries is dwarfed, has been dwarfed, by simply investments in the education of women as the factor most responsible for improving women's health. We have to own that. We have to know that there's so many other sectors that are important for advancing population health and public health from the vantage point of these sustainable development goals. And I'm sure we'll be touching on some of these topics as this conversation will ensue. Okay, so this is structured as a conversation. We're gonna begin now. Um, we'll start with Paula and continue on through the rest of our speakers before we bring, open it up to a moderated discussion that I'll moderate with our speakers. But we're gonna leave plenty of time for a conversation with you. We have microphones in front. Uh, we would just love to have you come and share your thoughts. But let's start off with Professor Breeze. Thank you, Howard. And thank you for the invitation to be here today. I would like to acknowledge and thank the Anishinaabe, Mississauga, Haudenosaunee, Ojibwe, Chippewa, and Huron-Wendat nations for tolerating me to be on their land today. It is very humbling to be here, actually, as I'm relatively new to the science of climate change and planetary health. I've spent most of my adult life working uh, to address the HIV pandemic, both here in Canada and globally. Uh, and we aren't there yet, but there is at least light at the end of the tunnel. And as I come up for air and take a good look around, what I've come to realize is that for the 25 years that I've been focused on HIV, our planet has taken a serious nosedive. When I'm in Toronto or virtually any uh, major urban center in North America, climate change feels like it's something that's happening out there, far away. It's very much business as usual here. Sushi for lunch or tofu quinoa, tofu quinoa salad. Um, we live climate controlled lives, heat on in the winter, AC in the summer, in our homes, offices and cars. We can get whatever we want, wherever we want, for, uh, pretty much whenever we want it. When there's a drought, we can't, we can't water our lawns or wash our cars. Yet when I'm in Kenya, climate change is upfront and personal. Like with the drought that we're just emerging from now, there's been a serious shortage of milk and dairy products all over the country for months because the cows aren't giving milk. Since most livestock in the country depend on grazing, they don't have enough to eat, so they don't give milk. Can you imagine going into a major supermarket here and being told that there's no butter on the shelves because of drought? The line in Kenya between climate change and its impacts is very thin. It strikes me that the differences between the two countries isn't a coincidence. Naomi Klein talks about collective cognitive dissonance, which we seem to have about climate change. We know it's happening and sometimes we really feel it, like for example, the flooding along the Ottawa River. But somehow we're still on the same path of tar sands, new oil and gas pipelines, urban sprawl, and disposable everything. In some ways, it's no different in Kenya. I've noticed, for example, that one of the best things for forest conservation there is actually drought, because everybody starts talking about the, the need to conserve forests and then it rains and everyone starts talking about something else. Everyone aspires to have nice things, nice cars, nice houses, land. In most places, the bigger the better. We call it living the dream. But unfortunately, our present patterns of consumption are together with and facilitated by technology, urbanization, population growth, driving climate and other environmental changes, putting our planet over the tipping point in its ability to regenerate and to sustain life. In general, high income countries are driving this in both absolute and relative terms. But it is low income countries and low income communities within high income countries that are paying the highest price with their homes, livelihoods and lives. 
They live in flood and drought prone areas in substandard housing with very little to fall back on when something goes wrong. What I find particularly frustrating is that it doesn't have to be this way. And we actually know a lot about what we need to do to change. Where we need the most research, as far as I can tell, is how to apply and scale up this knowledge to communities around the world, including Canada. As a majority of people now live in towns and cities, cities should be at the forefront of true sustainable development, meeting economic, social, and environmental uh, benchmarks. Cities could pave the way for a transition to a circular economic model, whereby economic growth is decoupled from the consumption of finite resources. Uh, waste is essentially eliminated, like they've done in Sweden. Scientists, community, and government stakeholders need to work together to find and capitalize on the synergies and convergences that will help us to achieve a future where our ecological footprint is close to zero, or even possibly some positive. With the largest bodies of fresh water in the world, lots of land and natural resources that, if managed properly, should be able to sustain us in Canada for a long time, Canada is truly one of the best places in the world to be, given what's coming. And Canada has incredibly smart and talented young people who really get it and who really care uh, about what's happening. And all of this gives us a very serious competitive edge. And as much as the seeds of our own destruction have sprouted, the Anthropocene has, been, has also been referred to as the single greatest opportunity in the history of humankind to transform our social ecological systems into something circular, sustainable, and equitable. Our jobs as educators, scientists, and people in our communities are to inspire, teach, learn, motivate, create, and catalyze change. As one of my practicum students taught me some years ago, don't let what you can't do stop you from doing what you can. Thank you very much for your attention. Peter. Peter. Me next. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to walk about because these are really slidey chairs. <laughs> and, <laughs> but it's OK. There's a careful chairs will slide. <laughs> stapled all the way around. <laughs> For all the time it took to staple them all the way around, you probably could have put a different surface on them. <laughs> the other thing was that until a few minutes ago, I actually couldn't see any of you. And the reason was that the projector, when you're just raised even a yard of a meter above the thing, it's completely blinding. And I looked out into the audience because I thought, well, if there's an undergraduate here, he'll probably have a baseball cap on and I could borrow it. But <laughs> No such luck. Uh, I have got five minutes to tell you a little bit about Public Health Ontario to give you some very simple thoughts, uh, not nearly as erudite as my colleagues about climate change and what public health might be able to continue, uh, contribute. And then finally, to say something about why Canada, I think, is in a unique position to lead on this issue globally. So Public Health Ontario was founded about eight years ago uh, in the wake of reports that followed SARS and the Walkerton water incident. As a result, its focus, you won't be surprised to hear, in the early years was very much around communicable disease and how one could keep the population of Ontario safe. Now, since then, it's branched out quite a lot into environmental health issues and to issues of health promotion. And that was always what was envisaged. Because if you look at its mandate, its mandate is broad. There's about 1,000 people work for the organization, 600 of them in the provincial laboratory service. That laboratory service is scattered around the province. The Toronto lab, the biggest lab, is in the Mars building. But we've got 10 other laboratories around the province. And that's important because it's our footprint in some of the rural and remote areas. So for example, we have a laboratory in Timmins that serves populations which are fly-in populations, which are uh, 
native Canadian populations in the far north of the province. And we also do a lot of testing for Nanavut, for example, in terms of TB. So that's a bit of a feel for our agency. We are what's called a crown agency. It means that we're arm's length from government. The idea was to create a situation where people were free to do the science that could inform policy, free from the everyday politics. So we have a budget and we operate at arm's length from the government. And the science that we produce is used to help inform uh, policy formation. Now, the reason I came two and a half years ago to run the agency was that I actually like that interface between science, policy, and politics. A lot of people hate it. A lot of academics hate it because they think somehow it sullies their work. And a lot of policy people hate it because they don't see academics as having a proper job. And politicians, are, <laughs> and politicians are suspicious of both academics and policy people. But, but I love it because it's how you make a difference, OK? It's where you can actually make the science influence policy in a political environment and actually get things to happen. So I think it's a fabulous thing to do. Now, what can Public Health Ontario as the provincial agency contribute in terms of climate change. Well, unlike the other people you're going to hear from, this is not my specialist area, so I'm going to keep it very simple and share with you the way I think about this as a non-expert. I think about, first of all, climate stroke weather, then I think about vectors, and then I think about the movement of people. So first of all, the problem with climate change, it seems to me, is not that it's just a very gradual warming. It's the fact that that warming leads to quite catastrophic weather patterns and changes in what happens. Because if it was happening very slowly over a period of time, one could, I suppose, think of a way of adapting. But when, as we see, it has catastrophic effects, on water tables, as Howard said, and on patterns of weather, it's very difficult for us to actually respond. And so Public Health Ontario spends a lot of time studying heat waves, studying periods of intense cold, and having an emergency response plan so that we can respond as part of a collective response when things go wrong. So that's the first thing is weather. The second thing is vectors. As you begin to change the climate and warm up Ontario, mosquitoes that could never survive in Ontario make it across the border. And they start drifting north. And so last year, for the first time ever, we had the mosquitoes that have the potential to carry Zika and dengue in Canada. Now, thankfully, it was just in a particular part of the very south of Ontario, and I suspect they got a hell of a shock when the Ontario winter came along and they didn't survive, okay? But it's a warning. It's a warning that it can happen and people need to be aware. So the second thing is the way in which changes driven by a warming climate change where vectors can survive. So there's lots and lots of disease that you'll all know about that can be altered by that. And then the third thing, and the one that people don't think of, and I'll stop after this one, sorry. The one that people don't think of is the movement of people. OK? Because what happens is that when there are big changes in climate, when there are water shortages, when there are flooding, people have to move. They have to move in search of safety and resources. People on the move people away from their normal place of residence are very vulnerable. And you see that with displaced communities in Canada. You see that also with communities who move from other parts of the world to Canada. Those people are vulnerable. And so one of the things that people don't spot with climate change is that it gives rise, it will give rise, 
to very large scale population movements. I'm out of time, so maybe in the discussion I'll say why I think Canada could do something. Peter, thank you. <laughs> Professor Miller. Thanks very much. Thanks to previous speakers and thanks to Howard for this opportunity to speak to you. So I wanted to start off by saying something that I think academics often don't say, which is that I have no expertise on this issue. <laughs> uh, and I think it's important to say that actually because, well, there's much more expertise in the room, um, because this is an issue that affects us all, and, and it's something that we as civil servants need to sort of address. So I'm really here not for my research interests, but uh, as a representative of an initiative uh, within HPME, uh, I co-chair with Christine Shea, who's over there, a new committee on the environment, climate change, and sustainability um, that is working faculty, with faculty, with students, with alumni, uh, with staff, with management, with our health sector partners, to begin to strategize and then to really move forward in very actionable ways to embed sustainability into everything we do, to embed it into our educational programs as a set of core competencies, to embed it into our research, to embed it into our operations, to embed it into our outreach, and ultimately to have a major impact in all the work that we do. So what I want to talk about is why. Why is it that an organization like HPME, whose primary mission and mandate is with respect to healthcare, healthcare in Canada and in other developed countries, why it's important for an organization like HPME to really prioritize these questions, why? Uh, given uh, the importance of the wider public health issues, given the significance of all that Paul is saying about where the burdens are falling and will continue to disproportionately fall. And the reason for that is threefold. The first reason is the paradox of healthcare. That healthcare as a social institution is an incredibly important institution that provides essential care to people in times of need. It is also an important social institution that demonstrates social solidarity in a most extraordinary and extraordinarily wonderful way. It is a social institution that shifts resources from those of us with money and health to those with fewer resources and who are ill. It does redistribute wealth. So it is a powerful social mechanism that directly addresses needs and, as I say, demonstrates our collective capacity and will. So it is a force for good. <laughs> But it is also, and this is the paradox, it is a force for harm. Healthcare has an outsized environmental footprint, both in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the English Sustainable Development Unit estimates that the health and social care sector in England is about 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions of the public sector in England as a whole. It is also a major pollutant. Uh, of both uh, indirectly harmful waste, but also, also toxins, gases, pharmaceuticals, equipment products. And this is an outsized footprint relative to, um, to sort of the actual physical footprint it occupies. And is one of the most uh, environmentally impactful industries uh, as a whole. So we need to address this paradox of healthcare, and we need to rectify this paradox of healthcare. And there is a lot of work uh, going on to somewhat some significant work in Canada, but in, in internationally, I think there's real greater leadership uh, on these issues to, to mitigate the environmental harms of healthcare and to square this circle so that healthcare uh, really does fully advance its uh, mission to be health promoting and to be health supporting. So that's the first reason. The second reason is, is picking up on the points that Peter's making is that healthcare needs to adapt. Healthcare delivery organizations need to continue to provide essential services to people in the face of the, of the current and accelerating uh, dangers and risks that we're seeing, whether they be different patterns of illness or the threats to infrastructure. Uh, and the third reason that there is a need for concentrated attention to this within the healthcare community is the question of leadership. That uh, the leadership of healthcare providers, the leadership of healthcare managers and healthcare leaders in, in various sectors, and those of us in professional positions uh, um, who support through research and education the healthcare community, we have the capacity to, to lead by example, um, to make this a uh, top priority agenda item, to make it visible, uh, to advocate, uh, and through our actions and through our words to actually shift uh, 
some of the realities that uh, Paula so powerfully put forward. I want to close by saying that, um, of course, many people have said this who much more eloquently than I, and there has been some very important work in Canada. I think that the 2009 joint position statement that was signed by the Canadian Medical Association, the Canadian Nurses Association, the Canadian Public Health Association, the Canadian Healthcare Leaders, Canadian College of Healthcare Leaders, uh, the association that is now Healthcare Can that represents healthcare delivery organizations, hospitals, and many other NGOs, that which was toward an environmentally responsible Canadian health sector clearly acknowledged the outsized environmental footprint of healthcare and the, the importance um, of, of advancing policy and practice to change that. There's leadership in certain provinces, there's leadership among various healthcare organizations uh, around the country, uh, but as a whole, Canada is not leading on this. Um, there is quite a bit more leadership happening in other jurisdictions and some leading health systems south of the border, like Kaiser, England, the England, uh, English NHS has got some serious initiatives happening. Uh, and so there's opportunity for us to learn and within our community of practice um, to build and strengthen the capacity to make change on this essential issue. Thanks. Thank you, Kieran. Ifra. Okay. Um, wow, the mic is kind of. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank first begin by thanking the panel and Dean Hugh for the opportunity to be able to provide a perspective from somebody who's early in their career in in this field. Um, I think, as Dean Hugh has has mentioned and others, climate change is widely considered to be the public health is uh, issue and um, opportunity of the 21st century. I myself was introduced to this area in 2013 when I was working as a field researcher for a Yale University project entitled Africa in the International Criminal Court. At the time, I was interviewing um, victims of Kenya's 2007-2008 post-election violence in Nairobi's urban slum, Kibera. So having spent five to six days a week in Kibera for about three months, I was really confronted um, with the enormity of the public health challenges in that space, population density, water scarcity, flooding, um, and a various number of other issues. And then last year, um, the Trudeau government was collecting consultation from um, academics on various refugee issues um, in light of, or in an attempt to reform some of the policies that had taken place under the Harper administration. And in that um, respect, I had a chance to work on a working paper uh, for the government that looked at moving sort of the convention of a refugee beyond the post-World War II notion of somebody fleeing persecution to incorporate um, people who were displaced or were migrating as a result envi of environmental causes. Um, as Dean Hugh mentioned, um, my dissertation work currently is going to be looking at urbanization and climate change adaptation in an African context. But leading up to that work, I'm currently preparing my qualifying exam. Oh. And, <laughs> and that's looking at uh, the way social justice is considered in climate adaptation governance through bodies such as the UNFCCC, which is the UN Convention Framework, or the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And in that respect, I'm looking at um, justice in, with two distinct, so climate change as, as, as having two distinct justice issues, which Dean Hugh mentioned in his opening remarks. One being that the countries that have historically contributed less to the actions that have caused climate change, which is the greenhouse gas emissions, um, are disproportionately affected. And secondly, that those same countries are the ones that have the least adapt adaptive capacity and therefore are the most vulnerable. So um, I will be looking at those issues in preparation for um, my dissertation, which hopes to partner with the UN University's Water, Environment, and Health Institute in, in Hamilton in a project called uh, Water for the World That We Want. And what they are planning on doing is to map indicators across eight countries in order to provide governments with a tool that um, that they can use in order for them to stay on track to meet their, their various SDG goals. In this, in this particular regard, um, the SDG water goal, which is goal six. So I think I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you.
See, I told you I nailed it. Well, now we have an opportunity for a, a moderated discussion. Uh, the um, intent is to allow the panelists to ask each other questions or follow up on the observations or suggestions that are made for the next few minutes uh, before we open it up uh, to questions from the audience. But I'm going to pose the first question, actually, um, to Paula, um, which is that um, one could argue that the HIV epidemic and the global response to the HIV epidemic, which you've been one of the leaders in, uh, in, uh, in uh, addressing this in, uh, mm -hmm. um, in Kenya, uh, what yeah. is a model, not a perfect model, but a model of how large resources were mobilized to address a global pandemic, uh, turn it into a manageable chronic disease with huge investments in antiretroviral therapy uh, and a through a collaboration between high income countries and low middle income countries in the education, the outreach, the, the uh, supply chain, the pricing and everything else. Are there some lessons to be learned from that that could be applied to this more slow moving but perhaps even more disastrous public health problem? That's a really good question, actually. And I would say um, yes. Um, you know, it was, we didn't get to this point with HIV um, by waiting for, OK, and my apologies to any government people who are in here, <laughs> but for waiting for um, you know, government or the pharmaceutical industry or um, you know, policymakers. Uh, healthcare providers, you know, I mean, at first they were all dragged kicking and screaming. And uh, essentially activists, people living with HIV, um, you know, millions of whom died while waiting to see the sort of fruits of their, um, of their voices and, and their uh, work and their lives, um, you know, they, they worked and fought really, really hard. And, um, you know, I keep finding myself actually wanting to, like, say, act up, act out, right? Because that, that was actually the slogan of act up, which was kind of a leading activist um, movement, um, which I think still exists, in fact. But it's that kind of, like, civil society activist pressure that's what we really, I think, need. And for, um, for community to work together with politicians and academics, scientists, you know, we have to find a way to come together. Because I don't think there's any one uh, group of stakeholders who can, who can make the change alone. I mean, we're really all kind of in this together. And, um, you know, to the degree, the degree to which civil society, and I mean, we saw some of these mass protests, right, in the US. Uh, standing up for science and stuff, which, frankly, they didn't get the media coverage that I thought they merited. But you know, it's it's that kind of thing that has to build. The question is like, when is it going to impact people enough? Uh, and you know, I hate to say it, but sometimes it takes like some massive impact for people to realize that this is real and this affects us, and we have to like, you know, claim it. Um, yeah. Fiona. Well, I put up my finger too soon because <laughs> I think there's, there's lots of things to say. I, I wanted to pick up on, not on the question of the need for social mobilization, which I wouldn't contest, but um, on the question of the need for a pretty broad ranging policy response, which I think that um, the policy response to HIV AIDS has in part, but not in whole, represented. Um, um, and so, in particular, where that is a sort of a different challenge than this, is that um, you needed to innovate, you needed new medicines, you needed to new social processes of dissemination, you needed to address demand, you needed to mobilize and get it out to people, you needed to address pricing and supply chain, but you didn't have an entrenched incumbent against which you were fighting meanwhile, mm -hmm. who was in fact trying with every tool at their disposal to prevent your success. 
I mean, there were many trying to prevent your success, but not in precisely, I think, the same way. And it's further to a sort of a question, I mean, insofar as my research interest does articulate with, uh, with this work, which it does, with respect to innovation systems and the power, thinking very carefully about uh, the array and the complex array of policy instruments on the, the demand side and the supply side that can try and drive the type of pretty profound socio-technical transition that we're talking about, of the scale, of the depth, and of the speed that really is required. Um, so we tend to talk about tinkering, and I don't actually think tinkering is going to do it, um, that you do need a very, very powerful push um, and yes, that has to come through social mobilization, but it also is going to require a pretty sophisticated policy framework um, that goes well beyond, say, carbon pricing, which is our current obsession and a sense that that alone uh, might be sufficient. There needs to be quite a lot of drivers. I could talk about more about that, but I'll leave it to Peter. Peter. So, well, I, I do think ACT UP deserve very considerable credit, actually, for what they started in terms of a dialogue around um, HIV treatment. I also would credit um, the NGO part, uh, Partners in Health, uh, you know, Farmer Jim Kim, and um, the, the person who's the unsung hero in, in uh, my judgment, uh, at least, uh, Ophelia Dow. Um, I think they did an amazing job. They just refused to accept that people in Haiti couldn't be treated for, for HIV AIDS, and they just started doing it. And they shamed all sorts of people, including the World Health Organization, into changing their policy. So I, I think you know, a small number of highly motivated people can achieve a tremendous lot. But, I, but I, I fear that Fiona's right. I think the powers that are placed against taking this seriously are even, even grander and even more entrenched than, than the um, sort of neglectful uh, uh, disrespective approach that there was um, by some in the international medical uh, establishment towards HIV AIDS. But here's, here's the optimistic thing. I think this country is very well placed to show international leadership. Um, to the best of my knowledge, I have never heard the elected head of the Canadian government refer to climate change as a conspiracy by the Chinese or anyone else. <laughs> and that is a great start. Um, I also think it's important to think strategically about Canada's position. Uh, to state the obvious, Canada is not un the United States and Canada is not the UK. Both the United States and the UK carry baggage internationally, historically. They carry baggage. In, in, in the UK, it's in terms of empire. In the, in the US, it's a bit more recent. But there's baggage. And Canada doesn't carry that baggage. Canada is seen as an acceptable uh, party. Canada then has some very interesting uh, interlocking networks. It, it, it works through PAHO in the Americas. It works through the Commonwealth, so all of those nations aligned under the former British Empire. But crucially, because of the bilingual nature of this country, it can actually work with Francophone nations. And by the time you do the maths and add up all of the member states of the UN that Canada can get to, it actually has the potential to be a very serious player. And I think that is a cause for optimism. Ifra. I'll just add a final point about um, grassroots movements and in particular this, the environmental justice movement of the 80s was very impactful and you know, was, very, um, was a key player in bringing environmental and ecological issues to the policy level and in engaging decision making and policy changes in that respect and highlighting the links between vulnerable communities and communities of color as it relates to environmental risk. I think, you know, um, Professor Miller, as you mentioned, um, the, in establishing that larger policy framework, some of the resistance that is there, which I think needs to be named, 
is the global political economy and this like constant obsession with economic growth, which is one of the major you know, influencers of certainly the decisions that are taking place in the US. Okay, I think Paula has a response to that, Paula. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's kind of an interesting point because uh, uh, just going back to this issue about um, the degree to which um, you could t you think about the, the response to HIV and the response to climate change. I mean, still today, you know, stigma is like one of the biggest challenges to actually addressing the HIV epidemic. And 25 years ago, it was the biggest challenge to addressing the HIV epidemic. It was the gay disease, right? And people were like, what's well, happening to them. It's not like in my world, so I don't really need to deal with it. And you know, I keep coming back to this collective cognitive dissonance because there's a level at which we kind of know what's going on and yet we're not making the kind of substantive changes and we keep playing at the margins like Fiona says. And, and we're not making the substantive changes and I think that until we can come to grips with the magnitude of uh, the situation, with climate and other environmental changes. I mean, I think it's also important to contextualize this within the broader issue of planetary health because climate change is kind of the thing that is probably the most visible, if you will. Um, but for as long as we, you know, it, you know, if all of the effects are being seen outside of cities, for example, then what incentive is there really for cities to act? unless there are people like yourselves and I'm sure people here who are taking a leadership role. But we can carry on with our day-to-day -day lives because on some level we don't feel it. It doesn't really touch us. And I think in that way that it's the same thing with HIV. We have to accept that we're all at risk, you know, and there are varying spectrums of risk depending on, you know, this, that, and the other. Um, but we all have a responsibility. I, I actually think this, this concept of othering right. is very important. Um, I, I came it, across it first in the study of violence. And what you find in even cities and countries that have the highest levels of violence is that there's a very considerable othering, by which I mean it doesn't happen in my part of the city, right. it happens in that part of the city. That's it right. doesn't hit, happen in my community, it happens in this other community, of, often racially defined. And, and frankly, you can see some of that in Toronto at the minute, you know, where there has been uh, an increase um, in homicides, there has been an increase in gun, gun homicides. And, but a lot of the dialogue is, well, you know, the presumption is made that it's, it's young men in gangs related to drugs fighting each other. And it also happens a lot with drugs. If you remember the um, crack cocaine epidemic, uh, you know, the whole series The Wire mm. was based around the fact that the crack cocaine epidemic was, having in, was happening in particular communities in rundown parts of large US post-industrial cities. But what is interesting in the tragedy that's currently sweeping North America, the opiate, tragedy in the US and here is that all parts, all parts of society are being touched. And so to be blunt about it, you have, uh, you know, middle-aged white guys who sadly have lost a son or daughter uh, and, and white women who've lost a son or daughter to this epidemic and they are speaking up, and, and because they have the social networks, they are getting themselves onto radio and television and into the, into the other media. And it's quite interesting to contrast and compare what happens then as a response once you get over that othering. And so I, I wonder if one of, one of the secrets with climate change is to get over the othering and somehow to, as, you, as you're advocating, getting people to realize that it's everybody's business. Uh, before we continue, um, I, we're, we're coming close to when we're going to open it up for your questions. Um, I'd just like to ask if you have questions to already start coming to the mic, and that will signal me 
to make the transition sooner rather than later, because I think these people can just keep going <laughs> on and on. So if, if you have some questions, please feel free to already uh, come to one of the mics. Thank you. Peter, uh, I'm sorry, Paul had a response to that. Well, it's kind of one of the equity issues, I think, in all of this, that so much of the destruction that's happening around the world is actually invisible to us, right? So, uh, you know, a Canadian example, you know, when you're driving across the country and it, it seems like it's all trees everywhere, but if you just get to the top of that ridge, right, it's basically clear cut down the other side. And you know, what is, you know, what is feeding us is, for example, take the example of palm oil, right? And massive tracts of primary rainforest are basically being cut to grow palm plantations that goes in all of our food. If you start actually looking at the ingredients and the things that you buy, you see palm oil is in like at least every second thing. It's in Nutella, I hate to tell you. It's in <laughs> Lynch chocolate. <laughs> My favorite. It's in everything. Right? And it's a similar thing with soy. We sort of think that, oh, well, I'll become a vegetarian because that's going to reduce my impact on the world. Well, I mean, where, where is most of the soy being grown globally? You know, it's the same thing. They're wiping out forests in Brazil. They're destroying the pampas in Argentina to grow massive things to feed us and our kind of ideological ideas about, you know, what is the best way, whatever. And, um, and so we don't see a lot of what's happening. We go to the supermarket and we, we pick and choose and, and it, you know, anyway, just to kind of talk about the equities of what, inequities of what's going on. Um, I, we, I, we already have some questions. I'm gonna yes, I'm seeing defer that. the okay. questions. And, and, but I also forgot to uh, remind the audience that in fact we have a hashtag, in case those of you who are on Twitter are already starting to get buzzed and want to share some of the insights, it is DLS Urban Health, one word, hashtag. Thank you. Uh, let's start with Suzanne here, and then Peter, and then we'll come back. Okay, Suzanne Jackson. I'm uh, a professor emeritus here at the Dalhousie School of Public Health, and I'm currently chair of the Canadian Public Health Association. And in that role, I've been. Um, uh, was part of a discussion this week with um, the public health agency as they were preparing their um, next assessment related to climate change. So they've done an assessment that was published in 2008 and they're just now working up to start their assessment um, of the situation in Canada towards their next publication which even though they're going to do the work in 2018 it's not going to actually appear in public until 2021 apparently. Mm -hmm. But one of the, there, there are probably three things that I want to say about that particular conversation. One of them is that um, the, the situation that we face in terms of climate change and the data that already exist about what the effects are on health in Canada is, is going to continue for at least 10 years even if we stop everything now and try to turn it around and change it and go backwards. So this, the situation is quite dire. So that's the first point. The second point is that their, their report is a, is a description of the effects on health of climate change, but it wasn't an analysis. So one of the things that I talked to to them about was to, to look at the ways in which the different effects they were observing intersect and whether they can map and look at the intersections because they were describing them in different chapters or different sections of the chapter, but they weren't looking at how much some of these things are overlapping. And that would be a much clearer uh, path for them to take in order to understand this from a, um, a policy perspective when they're trying to talk to politicians. And the third thing is that they were very concerned about how to communicate to the public. So your, your comments and your points about the need for people to understand, people don't understand. Um, the average Joe guy doesn't understand this stuff. And we're not doing a very good job as academics, um, political, advocacy people, 
in trying to explain this because it needs that kind of really concrete explanation of how it actually affects you. And that's where I think that this report might help if they could do some of that analysis of the intersections of how it could actually affect you now, not 50 years from now, now. Um, but the problem is they won't be producing that report until 2020. <laughs> so we need something a little bit more um, action-oriented prior to that. Anyway, I, I just wanted to make a few comments along those lines to support the kind of things that you're saying. Anybody want to respond to that, or should we go on? Well, I don't want to, I do kind of, and I kind of, it's not really a response, so this is unfair, but I want to, I want to, and I'm, and anybody who knows me is going to be surprised by the next sentence that comes out of my mouth, which is that I really want to be quite practical. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so one of the, so one of the, so I react to what Paul is saying, and I react to this, uh, because I actually am not at all convinced that what's going to, you know, general knowledge that of how bad this all is. Um, but I think we do need some really tractable ways of acting. And although it is a piece and only a piece, I want to say again how important it is that the healthcare organizations with which many of us are affiliated act. And because their actions change the things you're talking about in two ways. They change them because the environmental footprint of what they're doing changes, but they also change them because they are lead users. They express a collective intelligence and will, and they drive, they shape the market. They make the market. They make certain business practices profitable. They make other business practices less profitable. They, as a one good example, have driven out the mercury thermometer where it was a very expensive transition, but an important transition, an environmentally important transition, a health-serving important transition, and it was done through deliberate, purposeful purchasing. And the other point to make is that where we have equity built into sustainability deeply, including specifically my concern, the healthcare sector, you have a sustainable strategy that is clear in connecting the social purposes to the environmental purposes. So the NHS sustainable strategy, sustainable development strategy, is social sustainability, fiscal sustainability, which is how we in the healthcare community we typically narrowly talk about sustainability, and environmental sustainability, which means that what they're measuring themselves on is what they buy in terms of the environmentally preferable nature of it, but also are social enterprises being employed? Are we employing people, uh, are, we, are we contracting with providers who have decent social practices, minimum wa livable wages, that's a particular Scottish kind of emphasis. Are we, as they are in NHS England and not in Canada, seeking to drive slavery out of the medical supply chain where it is deeply embedded in particularly consumables that we are routinely using and throwing away. So a sustainability vision that is deep and focused on equity and focused on the social purpose of healthcare can have significant and practical changes because it expresses a collective will, a collective intelligence, and a collective capacity. So I, while I see the value and the importance of public engagement, deep and sustained and ongoing, we also need some very tractable ways of acting, and I think there really are some before us that embed equity in important ways. Super. Peter. So uh, my, my name is uh, Peter Pennypother, and I'll be an emeritus professor in 31 days. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but by that, I will no longer be a scholar. I'll be a, a, num a member um, uh, of the general public. And um, uh, I mean, I think we, we need to change the channel a little bit. We talk about greenhouse gases. Now, to a certain extent, the greenhouse gases have been released. They're being released continuously as the north melts. The ice has melted. The change has happened. We're, we're entering into uh, a, a, an environment of change, which is going to be, it's not just going to take 10 years, even if we stop, it's going to take hundreds of years. Oh. And, and all of our economic models, even the discussion of sustainability, is about stability, about continuity, to a certain extent. So if you're really, really going to be practical, I think we have to get the message out that uh, change is happening. You know, it's not just that winter is coming. You know, it's it's change is what we're going to live with, for the, mm. and it's not just going to be hot. It's not just going to be cold. It's going to be downpours. It's going to be droughts. It's going to be disruption everywhere. And and uh, but I do think that there is a role for um, 
you could call it scholarly, or you can call it uh, 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 documentary. You can, to gather data, to be uh, consistent, to call something what it is. Don't call it climate change. Don't call it, oh, it's all the, the um, uh, BP's fault. It's change, and it's biopsychosocial cultural change that we're going to have to live with. So public health, which is the, the conditions for creating health, you know, the, the, the science of creating the conditions for, for health, is going to have to embrace change, it's going to have to document change, and it's going to have to tell, tell people that change is happening all around us. And um, exactly how you can get CIHR grants about that is, is no, no longer my problem, but, uh, <laughs> but, but this is what the universities have to embrace, I think. So uh, I'm, it's more of a rant here, but I think uh, perhaps you can comment. Anybody want to take the challenge? I want to have Ifra and the poll here. Okay, I'll, I'll start just by picking up on a few terms that I've heard in the recent conversation. Um, economic model, uh, collective will, and calling it what it is. And returning back to the SDGs, one of the things that the SDGs, in my opinion, doesn't do very well, especially in SDG 8, which is about economic growth, um, uh, 12, which is about responsible consumption, um, 9, which is about industry innovation and infrastructure, is that it doesn't call it what it is. It doesn't call out the economic structures that make these, that make the condition of climate change what it is today. So I just wanted to highlight that. Paula? Well, I, I just wanted to kind of point out um, that in, in reference to the previous comments and some of what we've been talking about, you know, I don't think it's an accident that we're sort of not reacting to the level that we really need to. Um, I saw a terrific documentary, actually, called Merchants of Doubt a couple of years ago, which I highly recommend. And it was all about political lobbyists. And they talked about how long that it took over 50 years um, from the time the science was known about the impact of tobacco, right, on human health, until actually, you know, lawsuits started coming and po political changes and laws and stuff started changing. And it's actually kind of a similar thing happening now with climate change, except that now, who is it who's funding the political lobbyists who are lobbying the government? Come on, you all know, right? It's the oil and gas industry, right, including the tar sands. So it's, I think that we, we, ha we have to be smarter about how we communicate and recognize that we're up against a political and economic machine um, that doesn't really, want it, doesn't really want change on some level because they want to make as much money for as long as possible as they can. And so unless, unless we're able to find a way of, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking of some sort of like martial art way of like <laughs> taking the energy and shifting it back. Um, <laughs> uh, but we, I think we have to be smarter about how we communicate maybe. Policy jujitsu. That's great. Policy jujitsu. There you go. Please. Okay. Uh, the warning or the advertisement uh, right now as we're, as we're speaking at the University of Toronto in our ivory towers, 6,002 labs are being renovated to world-class standards. Uh, somebody should uh, make a, a manuscript or a book of the accelerated discoveries, not only from the pandemic of the current ecosystem, but to the intersecting disciplines that it affects on all and every one of those discoveries that are occurring and happening at the University of Toronto right now. Thunder over the puddle. puddle. Syntax, uh, synapse, even, equal. A million years ago, we have, uh, and even today, because we're a billion years away from the beginning of, ma of, of time, a million years later, after the initial glacial pyramid uh, uh, destruction of the whole world uh, by the ice age, the tip of the ice cube, we have today as much water as we had a million, a billion, eight billion years ago. It's just that through science and pollution, one quarter of it is, one quarter of that uh, three quarters is bad. And so 
the, uh, the axiom, not the axiom, that would be a misnomer, but the, the handle on, on this law that we're trying to develop here with uh, our colleagues here is, um, is uh, beware of the watchdog of 3020. So science and pollution and um, the butchered tailor-made policies on the global pandemics of climatic dramatic change as a social movement, your trial and your personal uh, uh, prospectuses go back to the Renaissance. It would be an epic booklet uh, that goes back to the Middle Ages of the Arctic. Wow, that's a, that's a long time horizon. Uh, <laughs> anybody want to comment on that? Shall we move on? Thank um, you very much. Howard, can I, can I make a point um, related to what you could call uh, capture of the political process? Because I actually think that is very important. Um, and one can think of all sorts of examples uh, in various countries of the world where certain you know, industry-backed groups have pushed for certain policies. Tobacco is well documented, but you know, alcohol is a lot of al alcohol lobbying, the arms industry, uh, for example. But so here's the thing, in order to really take back democracy, you have to make some really quite difficult arguments. And so if you're gonna stop lobbyists uh, doing what they do, and if you're gonna stop um, firms providing um, political parties with financial support, you have to provide them with support, the means to do their business in another way. And so you get into some very difficult, unpopular, but necessary discussions like the political funding of, uh, the, the public funding of political parties. You probably have to have a debate about how much serving senior politicians are paid in order to stop them uh, feeling forced to look to their life after serving in politics. I mean, I think one of the cleverest, most innovative uh, policy initiatives I've seen in recent decades, and I, I, I apologize because I forget the name of the prize, but there's, a, there's an organization that gives a prize of something like a million dollars to uh, an African leader who leaves at the end of their term, doesn't try to change the constitution so that they can stand for another term, and has had a good human rights record and a reasonable record of competent governance. What a great idea. Give the, g actually make it worthwhile for somebody to do the job right. And so I think we'd need to have some quite innovative thinking and we'd need, to, we'd need to actually go to some of those difficult places like the public funding of political parties potentially if you're going to be able to take the lobbyists and industry interests right out of the picture, which I do agree would be a smart thing to do. I think that's the Mo Ibrahim prize. It's uh, one of the telecommunications giants. I think it's, giants just, I think it's a fantastic Africa. idea. Uh, Professor Poland. Yes, thank you. I um, appreciate having a, a, a panel on this topic because it's a huge one and uh, I really enjoy how each of you has underscored the various aspects of that. I guess I've been doing work in this area for almost a decade and I think what strikes me is two paradoxes that make this a particularly wicked problem. One is 90% of what people do that impacts the environment, they don't even think of it as an environmental issue, whether it's daily showering or flying around the world for vacations or any number of other things that we do, we don't tend to think of them as environmental decisions. That's one of the reasons I use practice theory in my work because it tries to sort of frame things in a way of understanding that most of what we've done in terms of environmental education has miss, miss the mark. And we see what 20 years of environmental education has done for the most part in terms of what we see around us. So I think we've got a huge challenge there for us in rethinking how social change happens and rethinking our modus operandi that we can't just produce better evidence and do more education and expect that we'll have different outcomes than we've had 20 years of doing that already. I think the second 
paradox, uh, and this is also where there's potentially a silver lining in climate change, is that this isn't an isolated thing that can be fixed or solved without all the other unconnected pieces, and I think several of you have alluded to this already. Um, and it's a paradox that I see front and center in the sustainable development goals, is you have one goal that's on climate change and some of these other environmental things, and then you have a goal that proclaims the virtues and importance of economic growth. And as Ifra has pointed out, the two are not fundamentally compatible. And that is a huge thing to wrap our heads around. And I think public health in particular is really stuck in a risk management kind of paradigm where we're thinking, okay, let's get ahead of the problems, name the issues, manage the risks, but it's always within the context of more or less stability of the overall paradigm. And I think the whole thing needs to be requestioned. And so I'm, I'm interested also in the contrast. I was just at an all-day event today with Vandana Shiva and others at George Brown College on climate justice. A very different crowd. Um, some similar points, some, so there's interesting similarities and differences between the two events. Um, but I think part of it is really, uh, especially academics um, in more privileged positions, um, ta taking more leadership and courage and speaking truth to power. And I'd be interested in, in the thoughts of our panel in how do we get at the roots of the issue rather than treating the symptoms or falling into adaptation mode, which is important also, but it's not the full picture. And that's the last question, and let's see if uh, anybody wants to take that. Great question. Paul. Um, so as a, as a newcomer to this, right, and I try to wrap my head around, like, how do you, how do you start? Like, we need, like, a lever of some kind to, like, create what is called a state shift. So some sort of, like, massive, long-lasting, uh, paradigm shift, really, in kind of how we uh, are oriented. And um, I like to, I like to actually think increasingly about food and water <coughs> as being potentially a lever. Because I feel like if we could fix our food systems and our water issues, we would go a long way to addressing many of the problems. We wouldn't get there 100%, right? But, but we would solve a lot of problems. Um, and, you know, there are ways in which I think um, s at least some low-income countries are maybe more resilient in a way. Because, ha so having lived through the 2007-8 post-election violence in Kenya, the city shut down. There was no bank that was open. There, were no, there was no money in the ATMs. None of the grocery stores were open. And, the, and what people did was they went back to their farms and they survived on the land that they, you know, is kind of traditionally theirs. So I think, well, how long could we survive, let's say, in Toronto, right? Imagine if all the power goes down, transport goes out. How long would it take before we descended into chaos? Like, you know, okay, a day, you eat the leftovers. Two days, you go into your, you know, storage or whatever and eat. Three days, four days, five days, people living on the 35th floor walking up and down the stairs. Um, and you know, we take for granted water and all these high rises, like I marvel at water pressure here now because I mean, uh, you know, it's not just gravity fed the way it is uh, in Eldoret. And um, you know, I think if we could kind of solve some of these issues and and think about food and water sovereignty, um, like having control really over the means of production of our food and where our water is coming from and the sanitation that is a part of that. You know, I feel like it would at least take us some distance um, and, and create more self-sufficiency while we're at it. Peter has a final thing to say. Um, so, so I think it's a really interesting intellectual game is to work out what the dumb things we are doing now. Because you can look to the past and you can see a bunch of dumb things. Like, who ever thought slavery was a good idea and justifiable? We look back on that now and we're quite rightly appalled. And then there are some things where we've almost affected the change. So, you know, the world has still got some way to go on the death penalty. 
but it's getting there. And in terms of beating children, most countries now accept that it's not a smart thing to do to allow school teachers, parents or anyone else to beat children. But it took a long time. And when I was at school, it was normal. And it so still is normal. Uh, in and it still is in a lot of the world. But we're making some progress. But, but if you were to look around for candidate issues that in 50 or 75 years we would be, uh, you know, if we're, if we're still lucky enough to be around, we'd be embarrassed by. We'd go, oh my goodness, I can't imagine that we ever thought that was okay. I think a lot of the things that you're referring to, a lot of the stuff that contribute to global warming are going to fall into that category, aren't they? The casualness with which we have treated the staples of life, the atmosphere, water and food, for example. Uh, they're going to fall into that category. But the challenge is to see it in advance. It's easy to see it looking backwards, mm. to see it looking forwards, and to think how embarrassed we'll be. That's the challenge. And so I think this is why these kind of dialogues are useful, because they begin to help you flesh that out a bit. Folks, we've come to the end of the session. Um, thank you, Blake, for that uh, final, very provocative question. Um, Professor Adelstein Brown is actually going to close the session. Uh, Professor Brown, in case you haven't heard, is the incoming interim dean for the School of Public Health. I'll be going on sabbatical July 1st. Staney will be holding the reins. Uh, I can't think of a more capable leader. You all know him as the director of the Institute for Health Policy Management and uh, Evaluation. Uh, Rhodes Scholar, a tremendous leader. Uh, he's been in the private sector as well as government. Uh, he often describes himself as a recovering bureaucrat. This will be <laughs> another wonderful way to recover. Please, Professor Brown. What Howard uh, failed to sort of mention is a very kind introduction. It, I'm the tallest person uh, in the faculty. <laughs> And if you look around the building, there's a lot of light bulbs that are out. So this is uh, <laughs> got some clear operational duties. L look, I, I have uh, two impossible tasks in front of me uh, right now. Uh, the first is to try to summarize a discussion. Uh, I won't do that. It would be impossible to pull out all the stuff that's come up and also the, I think, very provocative points that have come up during the questions. I will say thanks to Ifra, Fiona, Peter, and Paula for coming and taking time with us, and, and to Howard, obviously, for expertly guiding us through today. I will, though, try to put a bit of a call on top of what's happened today. So it's clear we have to do something. I don't think we can kind of rely on a particular policy development south of the border to say it's OK, and I don't think we can kind of say it's one of these things that will come back and forth over time. But I think what's nice, to a certain extent, is particularly some of the panelists have talked about what we can do. So it's not just that we have to do something, uh, but we can do. But say if Sully Benatar was here, uh, he'd say to me, well, Staney, you have to, you know, I know he is here, I mean, right in front of me. I'm like, hey, <laughs> don't be polite there. <laughs> he was here, he'd say, it's not that easy. You know, this is a very fundamental thing about overconsumption. And that's a big and that's a large issue. Okay, uh, Blake talks about the fact that it's nice to have a shower every day. Uh, we'd socially stigmatize people who didn't bathe like anybody. And, and I don't mean that as a humorous point. I mean these are fundamental small and large decisions that drive the situation. And so it's not going to be fixed by a clean energy policy, and it's not going to be fixed by individual decisions. It's going to be fixed, and this is the hardest part of policy, uh, doing a lot of things at the same time. There's no bullet here. It's a shotgun approach or something much more. Um, I think it's also a really challenging problem because as Peter pointed out, I think a few of you pointed out now, othering is a really easy thing to do. And we other the problem until it's too late. And our whole history as a, as a species is littered with examples of othering that got out of control. I mean, it's never in control, it's never a good thing, but we always thought it was safer in the distance until it wasn't. And I think that's a critical challenge that we have to face, and it's, it's easy. I think the final reason this is hard, this is particularly true for us as, as scholars, is that it's easy to look at a component of the problem and then wonder why that solution is not fixing the problem. I have a 
young student I met who was incredibly ambitious. And he was telling me the other day about sustainable agriculture and the need for these small scale farms and how this was the solution. And I wrote a little note back saying, well, you know, what about making sure that everyone gets fed and dealing with those issues? He sent me back a very thoughtful note and said, well, you know, that's a very important problem too, but I, I would prefer to focus over here. <laughs> and I wrote back and said, no, 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 you're not allowed to do that. <laughs> but you know, this is in some ways what we encourage in our own practice, right? Let's find a way of making it a parsable, trackable problem. Let's find a way of linking something that we're going to discover to a large body of knowledge that inevitably cones down the solution. And so it's a challenge for us as well to kind of grasp and struggle with what is really frustrating, really challenging, in many ways is outside the way of the frame. But I, I don't think it's all dismal. I, don't, I do think there's little sparks that don't say it's going to be OK, but they do say that there's something maybe to build on. And so the first is, you know, particularly at a time of great political contrast on both sides of our border, we at least have a little credibility. <laughs> and that's actually a pretty valuable resource. Uh, for those of you who've ever traveled around Europe, whether American or Canadian, you put a Canadian bad flag on your backpack, right? And now you hear all sorts of wonderful Texas accents with the maple leaf right behind it. <laughs> but that's important because this is always an opportunity of working with people, right? And that's where the improvement actually happens. Um, there's also some commitment. I have an 8 and a 10-year-old, and every weekend they want to talk about what they figured out that will fix climate change. Now, Issues about hair dryers and a variety of other things and leaving the fridge door open obviously are not the right solution. <laughs> but actually, it's fantastic that a kid that age feels that this is something worth talking about. And this isn't something that necessarily we talk to them about. It's mostly table manners at this age, right? But this is what they want to talk to us about. And so I think that's valuable. There's a, there's a credibility and there's a commitment. But the second thing is you know, we, we love to talk about innovation, right? That somehow innovation is going to save stuff. There's really only one innovation sector that's making money right now in this country. Part of it is water, which, you know, given Paul's comments, gives me a little bit of comfort. And the other part is actually the green energy. And maybe we shouldn't kind of miss over all of that. Maybe we should figure about adopting what we're already doing well here and bringing that in. And that is a place to maybe think about what we do to buy energy. Um, the third thing that gives me a little bit of hope, and I, I'm glad it was brought up twice, which is the issue of refugees, right? We can actually treat a lot of the symptoms. And I think, you know, this false distinction about who's a refugee, who's deserving, and everything else is probably a, a fiction of really just the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, my grandparents came to this country. Uh, one fled a country where a government was shelling its own citizens. Two fled famine that was basically related to a mismatch between crops and climate. And the last one fled after being indentured, basically sold or leased to a family. And that was just all the people that we welcomed into this country at that point. We didn't make these distinctions. And as we start to think about how we think about who's a refugee or who's deserving, I think it's much more important to think that people don't move because it's easy. We don't make big transitions because it's fun. Uh, they, become, they come because there's a problem. And maybe as we treat the symptom on this, we can kind of get back a little bit to our roots. So I, I said the first impossible task was to summarize tonight's discussion. I, I've obviously failed at summarizing it. My second is to thank Howard, OK? Um, you know, Blake raised the right sort of call at the end that these are wicked problems that we need to confront and deal with. And that several times people have talked about the importance of speaking truth to power. Well, this is within a privileged environment. It's within a sort of very pampered sort of place where we're going to have a little celebration afterwards. <laughs> but we're doing it. And I'm very grateful to Howard for raising a voice like that. And last night, Ross Upshur pointed out that this is not the first time for Howard to do this and to speak truth to power on very com uncomfortable and difficult subjects, which probably good that we had in America because it's not <laughs> an easy thing for Canadians to do. So. <laughs> uh, the second thing is, you know, the school is the first new faculty at the university in decades. And uh, you know, if you think about the history of universities, you realize they are fundamentally dysfunctional versions of a monastery, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which means that nothing changes. <laughs> and so the very fact of getting something new and getting it accepted and putting a cap on all of it is a remarkable accomplishment. Welcoming in IHPME and JCB and creating a whole sort of uh, balance of organizations that are going to try to drive the change that we'd like to see is again a great uh, accomplishment. Uh, and obviously, bringing everyone together like this and creating a sense of community is a wonderful accomplishment. I can keep on going. 
Hard. I'll just say to both you and Ronnie that you know, may you move easily and gracefully to your next success, but don't uh, ever do anything but keep us close to your heart. Okay, with that, please join me in thanking the panel.